difference. Um, I'm Dr Nicole Lowbury de Bruin and I'm a veterinary behaviourist in Perth, Western Australia. And I'm going to try and give you a quick summation of why we medicate an anxious canine. Um, here we go. Right, so as a veterinary behaviourist, when I'm thinking about treating mental health disease, I'm thinking of these three areas, and I'm sure you are too, um, managing, modifying, plus or minus medicating. Now, why do we choose those, those um, why do we choose to medicate the dogs that we do? Because we're seeing that this is more than a training problem. We can still put in good management and we can still attempt to modify a dog's behaviour. But sometimes the brain just isn't in the space that we need it to be in to modify successfully. And that's why we're going to choose to medicate these dogs. Now, how does that work? Well, first of all, you need to think a little bit about what is a neurotransmitter. So it's, it's that that we're affecting when we use medication. We're elevating certain neurotransmitters that are, are of interest to us. So if you imagine neurons um, are like this, they don't physically connect to each other. Rather, they're in the vicinity of each other. And it's the neurotransmission, neurotransmitter that is in the space there that allows for these neurons to actually connect and fire together. Um, so it's affecting neurotransmission that we want to do. Um, it can get quite complicated and I want to try and simplify it because it's not so much um, about the neurons firing but what the end result of that neuron firing means and neuron firing um, can change the expression of genes whether a gene is turned off or on and um, that's really what we're trying to do with the elevation of certain neurotransmitters so the ones that we're most interested in, um, as you probably know, is serotonin. And it's often called the feel-good chemical. It has a lot of effects in, in different areas of the brain. But the thing that we're most interested in is connecting up frontal cortex and reactive brain. Now this pathway is a serotonergic pathway. So lots of serotonin is required to get a good strong um, linkage between our emotional controlling center and our reactive brain. So if we think of dogs as having poor emotional control, those dogs tend to have a dirty little track between those areas. And if we want a super highway, we need lots of serotonin to get that working well. Um, whenever you affect one neurotransmitter, you may be affecting others as well. Um, and one of, one of the other ones that we, we often uh, work to change is the GABA, increasing a major inhibitory neurotransmitter, when we see that perhaps a dog just has way too much excitation going on in there. Um, so the serotonin we mainly affect by using these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors because they're very much um, biased towards only affecting one neurotransmitter um, and this is the one that we're most interested in. And when we elevate this the, 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 the major effect is to protect the brain from stress. And this is because um, it elevates the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is what then allows for neurogenesis and better learning. Because in a stressed brain, what we have is lots of release of cortisol. And this cortisol 
can be damaging to our areas of the brain which uh, allow for working memory and good um, associational memory such as the hippocampus we want these areas of the brain to be working well so most of the elevation results from the use of the SSRI compared to other medications but sometimes we might be using a tricyclic antidepressant which also affects um, the elevation of the serotonin so it, it will depend on what your veterinary behaviourist or your veterinarian is seeing. But generally, because we're looking for um, an actual growth in, in the neurons and the, the connections between neurons, so more and more of these finger-like projections between neurons, um, this is not a quick change. Even though we've elevated the serotonin almost immediately, we have to wait for the growth of these dendrites. So the brain effects seem to take at least six to eight weeks to begin to make the brain changes we're after, but it's long-term change, six months that we're waiting for this change. So epigenetics, um, what it is, is a change in our genetic activity without changing our genetic code. I don't know how many people have seen that interesting documentary with the triplets, where the triplets had the different upbringings. So they all have, the, they're identical. So they all have the same genetic code, and yet how they ended up emotionally was different because of life experience and so obviously we see that in animals as well so even though genetics plays a big role what happens in an animal's lifetime and what happens in the parents lifetime and the grandparents lifetime has an effect on that individual's expression of those genes later um, here's some of the um, serotonin, serotonergic um, medications that you might see. Um, these ones, of course, are the brain changes. These, we want to have something like this in the background. This is more a situational med and could be useful for some additional effects. Um, clomipramine is probably the best tricyclic antidepressant in terms of elevating the serotonin and gabapentin even though its major effect is on GABA the inhibitory neurotransmitter it also elevates um, serotonin so sometimes when we're dealing with um, with animals that are, are very anxious we're also seeing states of hyper arousal and reactivity and you know using something like your SSRI might not have much of an effect on this kind of behavior so there may be a, a added benefit of adding in something that decreases general hypervigilance and arousal sometimes this will be used only in the beginning of the course of the SSRI medication and sometimes they're going to be useful adjuncts to use longer term. And then in certain instances where there's very serious panic, we're going to use something that is a pure panzeolytic medication, such as a benzodiazepine. And I'm going to show you some cases where there's very good um, evidence that we would want to use medication as part of our treatment plan some individuals as you know will be very um, responsive to a pheromone and if that's the case i would add that in too so if we look at this dog here with the response to clonidine so this is cuda um, when she's not had any medication and she's very vocal and she gets very reactive to stuff passing in the car um, and it's quite unpleasant for her and she's a declared dangerous dog and her owner likes to take her out 
for these um, car rides. But this, as you can see, is not that great for her. Um, and learning, she's probably making strong learning that this behaviour is successful as well. So difficult to change that behaviour. But with the clonidine on board, what we get is a more kind of sedated individual, still alert enough to look around and see our environment, but not so apt to bark. Um, and that's kind of a state where maybe more learning, a positive um, association is possible. So you can see that by bringing down that reactivity, there's a possibility for some emotional change. So, um, so say you've got your, your, your daily medication on board, um, you will, oh, sorry, you will also want to be including perhaps an adjunct and perhaps a pheromone. Why have I got that funny little thing in front of me? Try and get rid of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and this will be going on for months to years. So then we may be adding in an anti-panic medi medication, maybe either just for events, or it could be being used on a more regular basis. Um, we have lots of various benzodiazepines and that can require some trialing to know which one is going to work for that individual. Um, we're always going to look to see what, what um, effect pain is having on these dogs because that can certainly be an underdiagnosed issue. Um, and then we might be considering are we going to decrease arousal by the addition of something that elevates GABA. So that might be gabapentin and it, or it might be pregabalin, they're quite similar. We're going to think about our pheromones. Are we going to use any of these other products which might be useful for an individual? So if we look at this individual, this is obviously a condition that is far more severe than um, modification on modification and management can make a difference for. So... Hmm. Archie, no. Why is it not Archie, stop. So for some reason that video is not working. But what that is, is a dog spinning and holding his flank in a very distressed way. Um, that kind of behaviour is a compulsive behaviour and will not respond um, to modification on its own. Hoping this one works. Yep. So here we have a fly catcher. Um, so this dog looks in the sky and is snapping away at invisible or hallucinatory um, flies. So again, a strong genetic component for this condition. It's repetitive, difficult to interrupt, and is no longer serving normal function. And starts to engage really, starts to interfere rather a lot in normal interactions. Um, so these kind of dogs definitely uh, are the ones that will benefit from the addition of medication. If we've got high level escape behaviour, so this is the, the, the uh, after effects of a dog pulling at a fence, this is from from clawing um, at the ground at a fence and this actual piece of fence came in stuck into the abdomen of a dog and this has been removed by the firefighters so um, you know these kind of patients even though obviously they need a lot of physical repair these dogs need emotional repair as well and they're definitely the kind of animals that need a good treatment plan that um, alleviates this panic. When we have um, animals with severe noise phobia, um, we, we often need medication as well. So this 
dog is responding here to the simple draining of the dishwasher and you can see that it is trying to attempt escape from the sound. Um, ears back, slow moving, poor lifts, lip licking, really, really distressed at this very benign urban noise um, that sends it looking for a place to hide. So trying to find something that alleviates this is really, really important because obviously this is a welfare issue. So these noise phobias, they need a SSRI or a TCA, but then they may need um, extra medication for ahead of these events. So if you're seeing signs of phobia, which is a profound ungraded response where the signs are severe like this, um, I don't really think you should be imagining that you can train this away without the additional help of medication. This is a brain that's really, really struggling um, and you need to do, you need to refer that to someone who's very um, in tune with how to use these medications. So another example of some yeah. strong fears. Um, so we've got the huff huffy bark of this young beagle who can't handle the um, new person in the house. Um, and this is an abnormal level of, level of fear. We've got the old beagle, couldn't care less, um, but the young beagle who has poor breeding and poor early socialization experiences now can't handle um, any newness. So we really worry about this in a young dog like this because this level of fear the strategies could change over time to a more offensive style. Um, this dog is currently, you know, avoiding mainly, um, but you know that could certainly change over time. When I see this level of fear in a, in a young dog, I don't want to let this go untreated. You'll get a sense, I think, here of the hackles, the pilo erection. Um, you know, the conflict in the dog. Sorry, did I skip one? No. So this bridge analogy is quite good, I think, because if um, post-traumatic stress disease happens, um, in, in humans, what is considered to happen is that you have a genetic predisposition to stress causing your bridge to break. And I think it's pretty clear that this would be similar in dogs. So if you are lucky enough to have the genetic code to make a really strong bridge, it probably won't matter what level of stress you um, experience, you'll still maintain normal functioning. But sadly, if you have the genetic code that means your bridge is weak and doesn't have much structural um, strength to it, the, the, the bridge may fall despite any stressor um, at all. And sometimes it just requires a smaller stress um, for that bridge to break. So this analogy is good to help um, clients understand why they've previously had dogs that have coped with all the things that they're used to doing, maybe even punishment-based things, um, and it's always been fine. And they go, well, I don't get it. Why, why this dog? Well, it'll be about this bridge. So trying to explain to people that it depends on the genetic structure, what happens in that dog's lifetime, what happens in that dog's um, uh, uh, ancestor, in, in, um, ancestor's lifetime, all of those things have an effect. And lastly, I just want to say that these common denominators of punishment 
these can be the stresses that break the bridge, right? So definitely this is, has no place in good uh, veterinary behaviour medicine or good training. There is never a reason to add this into your toolbox. Um, this is a stressor. This can be the stressor that breaks that bridge. So I think that's it for me. Um, I hope that that's been helpful and um, please look at my website animalsense.com.au um, to help understand these kind of areas more and, and keep learning and keep enjoying your um, learning through the Institute of Modern Dog Trainers. Thanks very much.